Hi there, Adam here with Canadian Hobbies. As you can see in front of me, I have a Tamiya T202 stock chassis. This is the Toyota Supra, and as you're all aware of, there's many different variants, including the Subaru BRZ, Subaru WRX, the Lancer Evolution that I would love to get hold of. This is going to be an in-depth build of the car, um, where I will be taking my time and making sure, you know, doing proper care of taking parts off the part tree, trimming off the extra tab, sand it, yada, yada, yada. The reason why I am building this car is at my local outdoor dirt oval track. I am trying to introduce a new class that I think will take off. Now this class will be using a stock TTO2 without any upgrades besides bearings. Uh, they will run late model bodies that are purchased from McAllister Racing and they will run a spec tire that works well on the dirt. Um, so without further ado, let's get started on this build. So this version is uh, without the speed controller. Um, brush speed controls can be had pretty cheap, but when this kit was purchased, it was a little bit more during the shortage of what's going on and I guess in the transitioning time between the Tamiya speed controllers and the Hobbywing speed controllers. So as you can see the box art is of the Toyota Supra with kind of like a wide body kit to it. Um, this body will not be used. I don't know if I'm going to sell off the body or use it in another form of RC racing with uh, the on-road on uh, indoor season going on currently. So first I'm opening this box and what kind of sucks is I already see something that makes me a little bit sad. Um, the Toyota Super Body is already pre drilled and you know it's cool because they pre drill it because it will not not directly onto the Tamiya chassis but um where I was hoping to use this in a different different class of racing that's gonna suck because I don't want to have additional body holes so I guess I'll be selling the body off. Darn it so we got the tires that go with the kit as well that I do not intend to use, so I'll put those to the side. And we actually have a fairly large bumper, which is going to be great for the class because I do require a large bumper for it. So we will pull out the remaining parts trees, get the box out of the way, and get going with the build. We're going to definitely need the manual because we're going to follow it to a T. And that is just a couple of things. Window masks, sticker sheet, and so forth. So we won't need any of this for now, so we'll put that to the side as well. So, without further ado, let's get started. So, with this car, the plan is to run it on um, a dirt oval. So, it's going to be outdoor. The track's not going to be smooth because it's, not, it's, not, it's dirt. It's not clay. So, it's going to be set up in the rally configuration to provide higher ground clearance. All right, so let's get going. So we're going to be going down, I guess, starting off on step three here. The motor won't uh, probably not be installed off the bat because I will be doing a braking period with the motor.
and the stock bushings will not be used and they will be re replaced with bearings. Okay. So we'll first we'll part this bag here because we will need the spur. to the side for now. Okay, so you will require, I guess, this perch tree here. This particular parts tree has our dog bones, our dry shaft, and the out drives and so forth. So we are going to first start off grabbing one of these out drives. And with breaking off the parts tree, it leaves a little bit of a burr. I don't know if I'll be able to focus and see that, but there's a little burr ends up being left there. And I want this to be as smooth as I can, so I'm just going to trim that down. And I just gave it a light sand. So it looks like we're also going to require this little piece that is on this these parts trees. A little cup. And we're going to require an 11 or 5 millimeter by 11 millimeter bearing. So, because we are using bearings, even though it indicates put grease on there, I shouldn't have to really do so. And we got to find the little pin. So we'll open up parts bag A here. And I got little trays. So it's gonna be open up the bag <coughs> that has the pinion. So the pinion that comes with this kit is uh, a 22 tooth. I very much recommend, do not, and I repeat, do not use this pinion. This is a aluminum non-hardened pinion and it wears out incredibly fast, makes a powder fragment inside the, uh, the casing for the spur. Just toss it out. What I recommend is getting a Robinson Racing uh, Mod 0 0.6 pinion. Um, the part number is like, you know, it might be like RR or some of that, but it's 1122. And it's a 22 tooth mod 0 0.6 pinion from Robinson Racing. Get that, um, and then you should have a lot less issues going on with the drivetrain. So what I'm grabbing right now is a small little pin. That pin is going to get inserted through a hole opening. All right, as such. But also what we got to do is you can see right now I'm actually, there's a cap and you can see I'm spinning it. There is a slot that's actually curved and you got to make sure that you line that up. So there's a slot, so I don't know if you can see it. A little slot on this plastic piece that lines up to the pin. And now it's straightened out. All right. 
So you got that on, we're gonna grab our spur, slide it over that pin, and then it should kind of close up and be tight and flush. We are gonna follow up with another pin, uh, another bearing. Right, roll away. Okay, so you got another bearing. And then we need to finish it off with this uh, GB2. So these particular parts, I guess they're loose already, and they have two flats inside here that would fit onto the end of the shaft here. So that is the first step done. So the next thing is we're gonna do the same to the other side. Um, so we will grab the second lay shaft piece, or propeller shaft, and you can see more so I have tabs sticking off. So obviously you don't want those that cause windage or could get caught on something in drivetrain. So I'm just gonna knock these off with the knife. So it's nice and close and then finish it off with some sandpaper. Just to get rid of any high spot or burr. So I'm gonna grab my lay shaft. I need two bearings. And then finish it off with the other uh, crown gear or whatever. Then we're gonna have to grab dry shaft. Now I think there's two of these here, but I think they are the exact same, just because you have kind of just the same perch tree going on. So I'm just gonna grab a pair of scissors here. Snip as close as I can. Trim the excess way with the knife. And then All right, so that's done. Okay, so that's the dry shaft there. I need to grab the chassis. And you gotta kind of spread this bearing out. It's gonna fall. So in the chassis here, there is two bearing case points here. And there's two that are situated back here as well. So you want to make sure that your bearings drop in their respective spots. Okay, so that's spinning nice and free. And oh, before I put this down, it looks like I had missed a little support in the center. So I'll just pull that dry train off and I just need to kind of track that part down. So there's, all right, so it is on this parts tree here. It's parts tree D, it looks like, that routine has those parts. So parts tree D, this has like uh, the speed controller holder. You're, you'll see that it has your battery hold down and uh, casing for the drivetrain, but I need these two particular parts right here, I guess it's number 15 and number two. So yeah, D2 and D15, as stated on the manual. So it's broke off the tree, so I'm just gonna go in here, give a little trim with the knife. Now, I don't know if I'll be able to get in here sandpaper, so I'm just gonna do what I can with the knife on that part. And here's the burr on this particular part. Knock that down. And give it a little bit of fit sand. So this part, what I missed to throw in here, this particular small little bracket fits in between those two bearings to provide some additional support and it probably can give um, some additional shielding um, 
from debris fall inside of it. Okay. This will also be useful to hold the drivetrain down. Okay, so you see how that's uh, coming together. This is the one little cap. Pops it down. So we need to use two uh, three by uh, uh, 10 millimeter screws. So when you measure these button head screws, you measure from the bottom of the below the edge of the head. I'll get that in focus, I apologize. So the, there's the button head. Let's see if you can focus. From the very bottom of it to the bottom of the thread. So it's gonna be the bottom butt head to the bottom of the threads. I need one that's 10 millimeters. So that's an actual eight millimeter that was in that one bag that I have to open. So we'll open up the second bag here. And I need a screw that is 10 millimeters long. And this should be one of them. So it's going to look like, I guess, the silver screws are the ones we'll need. Now, what I do recommend is for all these screws, because you're cutting in fresh threads into the plastic, um, you want to use some sort of grease as a lubricant to help cut into the plastic. So there is some grease that's included, um, but what I'm just using is just some like synthetic brake lubricant, synthetic dielectric grease. Um, I'll be using this in the rear differential as well. But I'm just going to put a little bit of grease into a container. Grab my screwdriver. Okay, and then I'm just going to dab, dab a little bit of grease. I got a little bit of grease on the very starting points of the thread, and that's just going to help uh, to cut clean threads without much effort into the plastic, so you don't risk cracking the plastic open. So having that little bit of grease in there makes those literally threading like butter. So. Just want to get the first threads. You don't need, you don't need a lot, just uh, give it a light coating on the first couple threads, and that will go a long way to ensuring you don't break the plastic. Sorry, I'm going to adjust my camera just so it's a little bit more in view of what I am doing. Okay, because I kind of been working close to the table, you're having probably a hard time seeing what I've been doing. So I apologize. So I, just, I got done this uh, up to stage five right now, or step five, where I have the cover screwed down. Now we're going to go into the point of building the diffs. So that's where we are going to require, um, <coughs> for each diff, this particular part tree, where we got the kind of little spider gears and the center holder for the spider gears and the more crown gears or whatever they call them. So we're just going to spin them off the parts tree. And in the manual, it says to try to just clean those burrs off, which I've been doing um, uh, with a knife, clean off the little tabs just so that there's no um, binding going on. So I'm just going to try to trim off the excess first. Side. Not, not that far to the side. Uh, so that'll probably just be sanding off. In reality, because of how they broke, it's probably just gonna be a lot easier just to use the sandpaper and sand off the tab.
Once again, if my head's in the shot, I do apologize. Uh, you know, new to all this recording stuff like that, and trying to be informative and talkative along the way. But you know, when you focus, you kind of just like stop talking and stuff like that. And you'll see that throughout the video. That I'll just kind of like just have like a lull, break one uh, moment of not speaking. So I'm just working my way, sanding off those tabs. You don't need a lot, any really much pressure, just kind of using the weight of your hand and the part itself on the sandpaper, giving it a light rub. Same thing as going to do in the little cross piece, just give uh, the ends where the tab or, or it sat on the perch tree a sand, and that should take care of that. I'm going to go ahead and get the second half done as well. So just take out the tree, you can kind of just spin them off. And by doing so, it doesn't leave much of a tab on the part. To me, a TTO2 kit and a TTO1 are really simple builds overall, simple hardware, but it's very rewarding. It is a great kit to do as um, a first kind of build. The instructions are pretty good. Um, there is better instructions kind of found in more expensive kits like on um, X-Ray uh, kits, but I mean, as a great, this is a great uh, intro to the hobby. Um, to get an idea, any to me a kit, a really good uh, intro into building a kit. <clears throat> Problem with to me a kit, it is very, very easy to start spending money into hop ups. Um, and depending on what your use case is for the car, like if you plan to use this for <coughs> competitive auto racing in particular. I, there's way better kits to spend your money on because you'll spend ridiculous amount of money in this car trying to hop it up to make it perform decent and it will never be as good as any other kits and you can have a kit um, that is significantly cheaper that will do way better on an on-road racing circuit. So if it's like a spec class I'm trying to hold, like uh, startup, this is great or something you want to kind of bash around the parking lot, uh, it'll work good. Or any other kind of Tamiya kits. You might, you maybe had um, a Tamiya or where as a kid you wanted to get this particular kit and you couldn't afford it, but now you could. Again, there's a really nostalgic reason to get Tamiya. I'm glad Tamiya is still around producing kits like that. Um, you know, all kudos, all that. So, and it's going further, further with this. We're going to start kind of uh, assembling our differentials. So you start off with uh, putting in kind of one of the bigger pinning gears. I'm going to, with building the back first, I'm going to start with putting some of that dielectric grease in here, just to kind of get it set up in the corners. So I'm using, why I'm using this grease is because um, if you use like an oil, uh, these dips aren't sealed. So it will leak out uh, actually quite quickly, um, but the grease is still sticky. It'll kind of stick to the gears, even if it slings out. Um, and it has, I guess, a kind of good kind of resistance to it. So by taking that center cross, you just take the smaller spider gears and you just slot in, and it will look something like this. If for my uh, camera getting to focus, whoa, it looks like that. And it's just going to drop inside as such. So I'm just going to give the center a push. And that is going to push any of the grease um, I had in there away and out into the corners. And I'm going to finish kind of topping that up, putting some more grease in the corners in between each gear. So. Okay. 
should be enough grease inside of there now. I'm going to follow it up with the other secondary gear. Push that down so it kind of smushes the gear around so you can kind of see how that's going. Follow it up with the crown gear. And there is four tabs. They just fall into these four little slots, which will allow you to line up for screw hole, four screw holes. So that's again like that. I'm going to grab those four screws. Almost lost them all. And the screws that are being used are tiny, like uh, very narrow uh, screws. So I'm going to probably need recommend to grab a smaller screwdriver. So I got a smaller screwdriver for the head. And again, I'm going to dip it in a little bit of the grease. Start threading into it. I'm not going to go all the way down. I'll get all four screws started, and then I'll go work my way around, tightening the tightening up the screws evenly. So what I have now is I got those four screws lightly snugged up and I'm going to start slowly tightening each one up, give a little bit of tightening, um, work my way around, I'm going to start with this screw, work over this one, then I'll go to this one, that one, and just repeat until I'm satisfied. Again, you don't want to reef one screw down all the way, you want to work like, in a cross pattern because you can make... Um, if you tighten one side up first, it might kick it off sideways, so then you won't have um, even pressure or um, smooth rollout or whatever you would call it, but it would, it might end up kind of like wandering the gear as you spin it, it might wander around like that. So that is the rear done. We'll put the rear in just so I don't mix them up. So with the rear, it will drop like that. So for the bearings that are used in the rear, they are an eight millimeter by 12 millimeter. And I'm gonna require two. And it'll just snap in uh, quite easily. And it's gonna drop that in for now. I'm gonna leave it, I will be putting grease in there. I'm just gonna get um, the differential situated first. And right before I put the cover, top covers on, that's when I'll put the grease in. All right, so now with the front, the front is going to be a little bit different. So the rear, I want the rear to be pretty loose um, so it can help rotate around a corner. But the front, I want it to be able to pull. Now with the class, um, I'm not allowed to have a locked differential. It must, it must be able to rotate um, in the front. You must be able to have the differential action working while slowly rotating the tire without causing the motor spin. That's the rule. So again, just cannot have a lock differential. So what I have here is um, silicone earplugs that I picked up at shoppers. We can pick up to any like little pharmacy or stuff like that or a Walmart. These are silicone earplugs, which I had soaked in W40. So this is what they look like. Uh, these little silicone earplugs. Now, apparently a silicone earplug has a very similar uh, rate a weight that people say of like two or 20 million uh, weight or oh, diff oil but um, that was way too stiff Oop, I kicked my camera over maybe I didn't remember but anyways, it has a very um, 
a very heavy weight, which is too much, but I found that by soaking it in W40, it really had softened up, allows it to be malleable still. Um, and you'll see later on also um, how it feels, the differential with having just the grease in it versus having um, the earplug soaked in WD-40. So we're going to kind of mimic what we did last time on the on the last diff. So I'm going to grab, open this up. So first off, I'm going to put one of those kind of larger pinions in there. And then I just need to use something to kind of start putting this stuff in there. So it kind of breaks apart a bit as well since it's been saturated in the WD-40, which is not an issue at all because you kind of want it to be broken into tiny little pieces. So it's kind of ends up being more fluid like instead of a solid mass. Small little tidbits I have in here. Don't really want to touch it because it's all oily from the W40. Uh, but that should be an, enough right there for starting them out. Grab that little cross piece, put on the spider gears. Lined up. I'm going to use a screwdriver to smush it down. So by smushing it down, you can see how the excess has squeezed around the gears, but there should be a, a good coating on the bottom side of the gear. So I'll just continue by putting some stuff on top here and kind of just break it up into smaller pieces. Just kind of try to smush these into the corner. As good as I'm going to get, cap it off by putting it in a little in the rear ring gear. Just making sure that this stuff all stays inside. Grabbing the crown, locating the tabs. And I can just give it a good smush. And then locate those four remaining smaller screws. A little dab of grease. the last one in his group. Okay, so I'm not seeing that screw. That's great. <laughs> um, we don't think I would have already dropped it. Ask me. Well, that sucks a lot. Okay, well, I'll get these three screws started at least. If I can show up right underneath my nose afterwards.
Maybe it's stuck in the bag. This sucks. Well, fortunately enough, I had other screws that are similar, but it sucks it's missing. Um, I've had other kits before where there's always like sometimes if you miss a screw or something. This gets with you on the cases. It's lucky enough I had similar screws in my uh, miscellaneous screw bin. So it's gonna work my way around. That should be good. So grab two more bearings for the front. And based on the front end, it should be situated like so. So when I spurt, oh, it's going backwards. So I actually put the rear end backwards. So based on the drawings here, it has the cape, it orientated like this. The differential is going to go this way, not, it does not go that way, so we're going to go in this orientation that way. Uh, the rear, I have put backwards, it's going to mimic how this drawing is, so this is actually backwards. And an easy way to check is as you spin your spur, so actually it's going to go in this direction, going to spin the spur this way, you can see that's rotating forward, and my rear is rotating forward. So I'm spinning the spur. You can see my dry shaft. It's going to see rotation. So that's going forward. And that's going forward. So that way I know both my differentials are going the right way. If I flip one around, they'll go in opposite directions. So now it's calling out to put on the covers, which is going to be in bag A. So this would be bag A. I can clearly see the different covers right there. there we go. Let's get the Break off both covers. 
take the knife to clean off the burr. Smart ass. Smart me. Okay. I flipped it over because I thought I got like a uh, little, the little tabs I cut off inside the case, so I went to flip it over. And of course, I knocked everything out. So, this was the front because I can see the little red inside of there. Okay. So I'm going to be needing the uh, M10 <coughs> screws. So now that I'm putting the covers on, let's uh, put some grease. might work a little bit better. I'll just out. I'll fill the void with grease. And then as it rotates it's gonna pick up the grease. Grease on each screw, drop them into place. And just begin spreading them down. I'm not going to go all the way down first. I'm going to get them almost all the way, and then I'll just do a cross pattern, screwing it down. And you don't need to go super tight or aggressive because you will definitely cause the uh, ears on the casing to crack. Good snug pressure is all you need. Okay, so that takes care of that end. So I'm gonna pull up the front out. Fill that bottom void up with grease. Stuff that in there. Put the cap on. So when you first start to spin the differentials for the spur, it's going to be stiff, it's going to be difficult, but as you use the car, the grease will fling off, um, leave a more of a kind of lighter film, and should free it up after. Now, with it being a spec class, of course, putting the grease on it is going to cause drag. And when you need everything you got on the motor, you know, it could cause a hindrance. So, I mean, use your discretion. I put a lofty amount, a large amount of grease on it, just because I don't want anything to wear out. But if 
for some people, you know, when, you know, money's not an issue more or less, so, you know, they want to get the maximum performance, they'll spend the extra money on replacing differential gears or a brand new kit. So, diffs are installed. So right now, like, like I said, it's a little difficult to spin. It doesn't spin necessarily freely, but over time it should, like it's already getting easier to spin. And over time it should work itself out. So now the next thing I'm going to be doing is there's the brackets for supporting the arms. I'm going to go grab those. Yeah, it's a little, already a lot easier. So it looks like I'm going to be needing this particular part. It's going to be A2. So on the A3, it's these brackets here. So I'll give it a spin. Free that part. Trim off the excess. like sand. Okay, that takes care of that one. The second one. So I'm going to need additional two of the silver M310 millimeter screws. Dab of grease onto the threads. Drop the hole. on as well and I'm kind of jumping a little bit on the steps it's uh, because of the exact same uh, operation I'm just doing the exact same time So currently at this point, I got the differential installed and I got the top uh, front section or, you know, I, I don't know, the internal uh, or inbound uh, suspension points for the top arms installed. So there's those two parts there. So now the next thing is to grab the front top arms. Now I'm opening up the last bag, so it's not, it kind of a little frustrating, but I guess it's how parts trees are, is that, you know, it's not one bag you open, deal with that bag, and then move on the next. It's, as you can see, I've been jumping, jumping around between bags, and now they're all currently open. So I am going to be grabbing these top arms right now. Now, it feels like this is like a softer plastic, so... So again, it's going to trim off that little tab. And 
give it a sand. So with these arms, I need to locate the little um, pivot balls, which are in this little bag here for the servo saver. You can see the four little balls that are rolling around. That's what I need. Okay, that's all four are out. So now it's going to pop these balls in. So there's a little pocket inside of them, these arms that they fit into. Let's see. Let's use a screwdriver head. Nope, that won't work out too well. So, a pair of pliers. I'm just going to get the ball started. And we'll squeeze. Now it's in there. Do the same for the other arm. Boom. Both are in there. So, <clears throat> install in the front. Uh, you can see that they have these little arm stops. They are going to go towards the center of the chassis inbound. So they both go in there. Now, you might notice, there's, so one thing I'm going to do, you might notice these have uh, indicated the grease. I am not going to grease those. The reason why I'm not greasing those parts is because the plan is this is going to be ran on dirt. Dirt will collect into the grease. It's going to end up being like a sandpaper and it's probably going to wear it out quicker. Um, that's my theory. So as You'll see with this build, I am not going to put any grease on anything that's going to be like external. Now, what I have here, ah, way too many. Way, way, way too many. These are um, five millimeter ID internal diameter shims that are 0.1 millimeter thick. Um, this is going to help to get rid of some of the slop in the arm. And I'm going to first start off by trying to put three on there. Now, I'm going to be putting these on the back side. The reason why I'm going to put them on the back side <coughs> is that if I have a little bit of side to side motion, I'd rather have them on the back side so it pushes this forward. I will have less um, caster, be caster, less caster going on. So it will be uh, more responsive for turning and stuff like that. So. Now, these are really tight fit. Um, they go well, but what I do is I just got it started. I'll just go to the uh, inner mount and just use that as a way to push it all the way to the end. So I got that one on, get the next one started. Push it in. And I'm gonna try fitting on three and see how it ends up feeling. It might always vary depending on um, the kit is, just how the tolerances are. Um, once again, these are a five millimeter OD. I'm gonna be greedy and put all three on. These are five millimeter ID. Sorry, five millimeter ID. Point one millimeter thick. So that is three shims on the arms. I'm gonna lose those, and then I'm gonna have to grab a front shock uh, mount to cap it all off. So there is one right here on this parts tree. And because there's three points on here, it'd be harder to rotate. So I'm going to use scissors to trim it free. Grab my knife. Knock off the tab. and sand off any remains of that tab. Okay, so that's done. Put that into place, and to mount on the front, I'm gonna again need an additional 10 millimeter screws. So dab of grease, insert into these front openings.
and then just screw it in place. <coughs> so I'm going to make sure these are tightened down, and now I'm going to check the fitment of the arms. So uh, it feel this feel size feels pretty good. This side is a little tight. So I want it to be even, so I'm going to remove one shim off of each side. So I'll only have two shims on the arms. So I'm going to pull off shim there. So I only have two shims on here currently. Now, put them back in. We tighten in those screws. And just make sure that they flop around easy, nice and smooth. This side's a little snug, but it's not too bad. I'll take it. Uh, this side's loose. Not crazy about, but it's not bad. Let me see if I can kind of play with this. So I'm backing off the screw. I'm going to kind of pinch it and then retighten it. And then on the other side, I'm going to loosen it, push the arm back, and then tighten it. So now that's loose and that's a little bit snugger. So they seem pretty good now. I'm can tighten with this. It's like, I know I can probably put that one shim back in there, but you know what, overall I'm pretty good with that. I think I, I, think I can live with this. <coughs> All right, so the front's mounted. We're going to go to the rear end now, and we're going to grab the rear arms. Turn off the access. Like doing every one before. So, with the rear, it looks like you can probably adjust the wheelbase, have it longer or shorter, depending on which way you flip this arm around, my guess. Um, maybe, maybe not, but we are just going to follow what it shows in the manual currently. So, what's going on is we have our, spear, our spur located here, at the spur situated this way. We'll take our arms and they'll be in this direction going in now with the rear we're gonna go and just hopefully put two shims we'll put a shim on both sides of the arm so we'll put one on that side ah, which I had nails Shim on this side, so you can see that I have a shim. Okay, so there's a shim on both ends here, and we're just gonna slide. So again, the orientation is that this side that protrudes out will go towards the back of the car. So we got that one, and we'll just do the same for the other side. Two 
shims. And then we're going to grab the other shock uh, tower mount. Knocking off all the tabs. And that oh, arm fell off. Get our shock tower in position. Grab our two screws. Stab of grease. Let's see, two screws. Really, well, this one's stiff or this one's smooth, so we're going to do the same technique. So I'm going to dock this screw off, pinch it, tighten down. That's snugger. This side, I'm going to back it off. I'm going to push on the arm a bit, and then we tighten that screw. So now that arm is free, and this side's a little stiffer, but they're close. I'm good with that. I'm just going to actually tighten this side up a little bit. Cool. I'm good with that. Okay. So, <coughs> the next step is um, with the motor mount. I'm just going to skip that for now because, as I said earlier, I'm going to do a break in with the motor by having the motor submerged in water running on a low voltage for about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, once I do that, I will take the motor out, dry it off with a, air, like a little air blower, and then I will lubricate both ends where the bushings are, and this should be pretty good to go. The reason why you do a break-in is there is two uh, bushings that rot There's like a rotor inside with a little calm, but um, there's two bushings that rest on the calm of the rotor, and that makes the connection. Now, when they are fresh, they are a solid block. They're flat. And you have a round comb. So it's a flat edge. You got a round comb. So you have a very small contact. And then what happens is as you break it in, it kind of curves and fits around and gets more surface area around the comb. Um, now, by running it in water, it keeps it lubricated, but also flushes away the material that you're rubbing, like, you know, breaking in. Um, you could do a, a dry method as well, as you just have the motor spin at a low RPM for some time. But most people do use the water to keep temperatures cool, keep the calm cool, to flush away any debris as it wears away and acts like a lubricant. You can find many videos uh, online on how to do it. Um, it's, it's fairly easy. Again, the big thing is you don't want to run a lot of voltage. One, because it'll spray water everywhere, but two, excess voltage is more heat, and um, it will just wear away the material too quick. You want to have a nice, slow, simple, smooth break-in so it doesn't scratch the comb, it doesn't scratch the brushes. So like I said, we're going to be skipping this step on the motor mount, and we're jumping down to putting on the arms. So it is looking like we're doing the rear arms first. So... We're going to locate the rear arms. So there is one right here. And that is the other one.
Now, parts like these, do you really need to take the, the tabs off? Probably not. They probably won't hit anything and get affected. But it gives me a peace of mind. Um, I'm a little bit OCD and a perfectionist. So this allows me to make sure everything's at my standard. So that being said, I am going to go <coughs> put shims on like I did in, on the rear. Um, I might have to remove them. I'm not sure. We'll see how that goes as I shim it. Might have to remove them. It's not sure quite yet. Maybe I can even get it on. So there's that one. Okay. So it looks like the arms are not symmetrical. And so that being said, if you were to look at the arm, and I'm going to try to hold it this way, you can see where it's notched for the uh, hub. It's orientated one way. So this side of the arm has a small kink, a bend in it, and you can see how everything's pushed off. So that kink area is going to go towards the back of the car. Okay. So that's one arm. And to be honest, that's not something I really, I don't remember paying attention to before when the previous one I built. So now I'm paranoid, and if you excuse me for a moment, I'm going to check and make sure I have the right orientation on the arms. Yeah. Yes, I do. Yeah, 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 I didn't screw that up. Okay, so I'm going to have to look for that rear hub piece. And it looks like it is right here. This is on tree A. What I do like about the Tamiya kit um, is that it shares a lot of similar parts in the front and back. So it's kind of nice in my opinion. It shares as much as it kind of can where the arms front and rear will be different because of the suspension and how it has returning. But everything else is shared, the shock towers and uh, arm mounts, arm mounting. Another thing is, you want if you're going to run this on like a carpet, you want to make sure you definitely take those tabs off. It's very frowned upon having those tabs. Um, if it catches the carpet, it could rip it, and that carpet's not cheap. So it's good practice to make sure that they are removed. Okay. <coughs> so I need to grab another one of those uh, 10 millimeter screws, fire that off in the back, which will hold it all in place. So be careful putting this screw on. It's not fully supported all the way around. Um, there is an open channel, so you don't want to go too tight and cause it to kind of separate the plastic. Just enough just to kind of keep it in place. Um, arm movement is good. I actually could probably throw in another shim. To be honest, how loose it is. But we'll see how it progresses as you. I put the remaining bumper on because I will push this bracket in. And it might tighten it up enough to be happy with it. So we'll grab the bottom bumper, as I just mentioned about that part. So there's going to be 
uh, four screws used to hold this bumper piece on. Because this is actually the main piece that holds the rear together. So it's going to be two countersunk screws and then two longer 15 millimeter screws. They are a different color as well. I had made the issue of over tightening them. You don't go um, excessively too far with it. I did that goof up on the first one. If you tighten it too far, you'll actually go into the differential, into the gears. So I'm grabbing um, 10 millimeter. Now the 10 millimeter countersunk screws will be from the very top of the, it's gonna be the very top of the screw to the very bottom thread. And that's close. These like it's nine and a half. Um, that represents a ten millimeter. So just again, using the grease. You don't need a lot. You just need the first couple threads, and as you tighten it, the grease will move, move its way around through the threads. But it makes it a lot easier to cut into the plastic without cracking it. it takes no force to thread it in. Okay, so that's good. That, again, you only need to go snug because it threads and easy. So these are the 15 millimeter. You gotta be very careful. Um, it is easy to blow past. So I made this mistake the first time I built it. Um, you can see how it has these, try to get focus, these, these cavities. Um, you would kind of think it has to keep tightening it to the one step inside of here. You don't you finish it, you end it right to this surface here. You only go to that surface, you don't go down into in there, you stop here. You'll see there's kind of like a small little step, a round step in there, that's kind of, I guess, a resting place for the head. So just be very careful, do not over tighten these. Um, do not go too far with it. The arms did get tightened up a little bit as we uh, put those screws in, and I'm happy with it. This is what I was indicating about. So you can see the heads of the screws are still apparent. They are gone up to this face. They did not go further down into that step. So make sure you do not keep screw. You know, you just go snug, not a lot of pressure. When you feel it resist, stop. Do not keep tightening down, thinking you have to go down to that step area here. You're going to end. Here, you're going to end on this surface. I'm an idiot. Um, simple mistake, rookie mistake. I put the beer arms on the front. So, taking out the four screws. And uh, <laughs> redo this again. I am no expert builder, just an enthusiast of the hobby. Everyone makes mistakes. Clearly, I've made a couple already. Let's try this again. So we'll go into the rear. Again, noting that the little kinked end, the little kink goes to the back of the car. screw. I'm going to have to put a new dab of grease because we're cutting new threads in the plastic.
grease there, so like squirt it out. Check out the arms feel. Feeling good. Finish it off with the two 15 millimeter screws. Just gonna go to it snug. It's decent. <coughs> I'm good with this. Alright. So that's done. Yay. We are gonna go to the front. So I'm gonna cut this off the tree. Now what the manual says to do is put the arms on first and then pop the balls on. I'm just going to pop them on first. I figure it's going to be easier. Could bite me in the butt. We'll find out. So that's one on. And that's the other one. Oh! <laughs> on that screw from earlier. Uh, Knockers. All right. Once again, we're going to shim it, but what I'm going to do in the front is I'm going to put the shims on. I'm going to put the shims on the front side of the arms to push the arms as back a little bit further back. Again, I just want to increase that caster. Um, Cast ring in the front. I want it as close to zero as I kind of can, just because of. Uh, I don't think I need necessarily much of the stability that having them turn back will provide. I'd rather get as much turning as I can with the car. I think. Eh, you know, no, I'm gonna just shim the bottom as normal, one on each side. one in each and just orientating that the shock mounts um, are out facing the outside of the car because of how the suspension will mount. I'm just going to repeat what we did in the rear. Sorry for bumping the camera there. Don't need to really put grease on this because I already cut the threads, but it's just good practice to keep doing it. Just be careful not to over tighten it because it will be very easy to strip out the plastic. It's kind of weird how they kick that arm right up. Might not want to have the shims in the front. We'll see once I put the other arm on. So the fronts are a little tight. So I'm going to undo what I did. I'm going to pull out the one um, 
shim in the rear. So with building these kits, take your time. There is no need to rush. Um, with me, instead of taking this apart, again, I want it to fit good. So I have no problem going back a little bit, re-putting it all back together, back test it, make sure I'm happy with it. Doesn't take too much time to redo this stuff like this. Arms have play. We'll see what happens once we put the uh, screws back in. This time I need to kick, didn't kick the arm up, as you saw last time. Oh. A, a little stiff, but I think over time it will work itself in, so I'm good with this. It's not too bad. Happy with that. Let's grab off some fingerprints. <coughs> okay, so on to the next page. Now it's going to be put on the steering knuckles. One. That's number two. Okay, so <coughs> that there is done. Knock it down a bit more. Little picky. So those are cleaned off. Now I need to grab um, the axle drive up or out drives.
So in the front, we're going to need five by 10 millimeter bearings. I'm right here. Get these bearings away. Bear with me for a moment. I am using my phone as a camera, and my phone was on the verge of dying. So that's rectified. So it's all good there. And we'll continue on. So I'm actually going to first build this up. Because um, it's going to try it on the racetrack um, in the indoor carpet season. So I'm going to see how the car handles um, there. So I am going to do this as the road going version not so much the rally or off-road um, but i will swap it over and i'll show you how that is done um, it's relatively very simple so when it goes to being the on-road version there's these little kind of spaces for the front, and um, you have the or little, these little caps. You see, they're a, uh, specified A B, or sorry A eight, and if you put it on the bottom, right, and when it rests, it shifts this up. But if you were to put this on the top side, because um, you got the two arms, right? If you put that on the top side, oh, sorry, has a uh, there's the two arms, right? So now it's like sitting down lower, but if that little spacer gets put in the bottom and then the two arms, now it's sitting up higher. So you can have, um, this is about five millimeters thick. So by depending, if you put this, if you put this on the bottom, it raises these hubs, which in turn causes the chassis to sit lower by five, five millimeters. If you have this resting on top, it um, lowers these hubs, which cause the chassis to sit higher in relation to the wheel, and the chassis sits five millimeters higher. So, what I also need to grab, um, I try to locate them, are these kind of little cone looking things. They're A6, I believe. Yeah, A6. <coughs> it's a little cone piece. So, 
So it also depends where if you put the little little cap cups I was talking about, if you put them on the bottom, these will sit on the top. And if you flip it around, then it'd be going the other way. So this orientation is the like the lower profile lower, lower center of gravity or not center but lower right height situation so we got that little cap up top here and the cup is over here but if you were to do the rally version then you would take this part that would rest in the bottom cap will go on top which you feed in here and then what this cap is meant to do is you see how the, it sticks out a little past that cap just goes over top of that to finish it off but that's how that would go if you were doing the rally style Grab my dog bones, two of them. So, once again, because the main intent is to be running this in a dirty um, location, I'm not going to put grease on it. <clears throat> I'm also going to need to grab two my two out drives. So I'm going to start off with putting the L-Drive in the front, followed by a dog bone, okay. and grab a steering knuckle with the little cup looking thing on the bottom. Let's insert it into the bottom arm. top and that little cup goes there and then to fasten these arms into place I need to use an additional uh, 10 millimeter screws so again, just a dab of grease One little thing is I almost missed is uh, a ten. It's a little tiny little washer, and that what that does is just kind of spreads out the uh, the surface area so that it will not uh, the arm won't pop out. There's the one. So, that one arm's installed. Try to see how the movement is. Feels a little stiff. Now, that could be stiff because of the dog bone. I'm going to first 
try to see how this feels back in the screws off the touch. And it did free it up a bit, so I'm going to slowly snug up the screws. Make sure it still rotates fairly, fairly easy, which is good. So that side's done. We will now go to the other side. spins freely. Just be careful flipping the car around as you saw multiple times. Um, the arms opened up and the little cap cups have gone flying. So just take care not to lose them. Good. <coughs> so that just feels good. And we will now start working on the back side. So to convert the rear end from like on road to rally is even simpler. Um, so first off, we're going to pop these bearings into the hub. Again, they are a five millimeter or a ten. Going to grab two L drives. That part is done. I want to find the uh, two dog bones. So that part tree. Oh, I'm gonna just pop off the L drives from the diff. Now that part tree is done. Trim. sand. Okay, so 
once that prep has been done. So, oh, that was very. So, depending on which way you orientate this, either in this right direction, so you got a longer distance, this will raise the hub up, allowing the chassis to sit lower. So that is like your on-road if you want it to go rally. It just gets rotated 180 degrees, so you have the longer length up top. Puts these hubs down lower in which the chassis, producing a higher, uh, higher ground clearance. So I'm open up part B of the hardware. Oh, and actually I just realized because I didn't open up part B sooner, I did do a small screw up on the very front here. Um, it's actually supposed to use a hex headed screw. So there's a couple of screws here that are hex. So you need to swap them out too. So there's a close up. Hopefully you can see it. This one has a hex profile on the very top. You have flat ridges on the side. And this is the button head round. See the head's a little bit bigger on this one as well. Yes. Sorry about the bump. Okay, that's it. All right, going back to the rear end, we're going to be using these funky looking longer screws that have only a couple threads on the one end. So we're going to install our outdrive, dog bone, grab our hub, and we're going to orientate it so that the longer length is down. 
then from the back side we will feed in the screws. So let's get first one kind of just kind of started. And then we will just tighten them in. Now I didn't put any grease on this just because it's not a lot of threading that's happening. And the um, where they thread into has a decent amount of material. The other side. Okay, so that is hubs on now. So now on our way to the shocks. So <clears throat> I'm going to have a follow-up video. And I'm going to show you a trick that, you know, I, I, I think I came up with it. I haven't seen it anywhere. It's something I just kind of did messing around with, thought it would work. It seems to work very well. Um, the first thing I always see with these kits, these Tamiya kits, first thing people do is they replace the shocks. Uh, which is understandable because, you know, these are friction shocks. There is no control of dampening. It becomes a very, very bouncy. and makes the car less predictable. Uh, now, again, the idea with this kit is that um, I want the class to be cheap. And once you start doing things where you replace the shocks, you know, you can get a cheap set of shocks, like this, the plastic CVA shocks, or you start getting to like the titanium coating. It gets, you know, it ends up starts to become a money game. And I want to avoid that. So I want to retain using the stock suspension. So I'm like, how can I make this stock suspension usable enough for people to average racing? And again, if I can use the same shocks and it's relatively keeps it cheap, but hopefully it'd be free. Um, what I came up with, and I'll show in the video, I think is really, really awesome. It works really well. It does a good job of causing, um, I think, some sort of, you know, friction dampening and actually works really well. A lot of people, when they do the test of where they will do this and the car just bounces, it won't. It will literally act as if it was dampened. Um, and it's pretty much free. If not, it will cost you a dollar if that, at your local hobby shop. Um, so once I build this car, I will do a follow-up video showing you how simple and easy it is to make friction shops quite usable. And that's why I'm going to be building the car in the on-road variant, because uh, I'm going to, during the weekend when I go have my local racing, I'm going to try the car out with that suspension setup where they have like the what I'll gonna so what I'll show I'm gonna test that out on carpet and actually see does it actually do well enough to absorb dampening it does it work well enough in an on road situation so with again the build I'm not trying to rush it. Um, just taking my time with it. Ultimately, the kit could be built substantially quicker, where you don't need to be so picky with the tabs. In a lot of areas, like this, the suspension here, shouldn't have anything that interferes with each other. But it's just a nice peace of mind.
hopefully everyone's enjoying the video so far. Um, you know, if you enjoy it, it mean a lot. If you like it, you know, uh, cool if you want to subscribe to it. I mean, I don't make tons of videos just because of life. Um, I don't have the much time to sit back, produce videos and stuff like that. So, you know, videos will come few, far between. They'll come up once in a while. And, you know, if you like what you are watching or like the other videos I have posted, you know, then by all means, subscribe. And when I make a new video, you'll be notified. Sandpaper is uh, pretty worn out. <clears throat> okay. So let's get to building the shock. So first thing is you got your main shock body piece. You're gonna thread off put uh, insert the top so you got this little notch up here. Little notch, you're gonna follow up the hole that lines up with that. You're gonna take a top cap piece, and there's like a little smooth lip on one side where this side has the ridges still exposed. So you're gonna have the smooth edge down towards the bottom of the shock, clips in, a little plastic ring, which you can take out. Like, I'm probably what I'm gonna do. This, I think I'll leave it out and I can then use like clips for preload clips to change my ride height. So I'm just going to start my spring. And then as for these, you have it start. So you got these two holes. The ideas are going to be lined up straight to each other. But you can start, start off at 90 degrees perpendicular to each other, slide it in all the way to the top, and then twist 90 degrees. Might have to use something like a screwdriver. It'll give you more leverage to twist it, and then it catches on a little pin inside, and then there you go. So that one's done, and I'll just continue on with the rest. I did break them all free. No, I did not break them all free. Ha! Ah. Sure they're all the same way. Yeah. Okay, let me put those rings to the side. So the suspension there is done. So we'll now go to the point of installing the shocks. Or I don't, know, I don't even know what you really would call it because the friction shocks, essentially, whatever. 
So the screws that we're going to need are these kind of funky ones. They have um, a solid non-threaded section halfway up the screw. Um, that is so that the is smooth metal on plastic for the suspension instead of having threads on on it. You'll notice that there is two different lengths of screws. So just bear that in mind as we go along installing this. So we are going to first focus on the front end of the suspension. And we are going to be using, I believe, on both the top and bottom, the shorter screws. So I guess it's going to be the shorter version because there's another set that's longer. I think that's actually used for the steering now that I remember. So we're going to just use all the kind of shorter lengths to melt the suspension. So we've got our friendly grease. And we're going to put them into, there's two shock position holes on the shock tower. There's these two, and I'm going to just put them in the inner one so the shock's more laid down. So you'll see on the suspension, because they're symmetrical, it's flipped. Um, so you can put them into the top hole location for the bottom side. And just to kind of mention again, like how I'm using grease to make it cut easier in the threads, but it's so easy to strip. Um, because the whole size, this actually is shock enough to put this one in. I think it's already stripped. Like I didn't put much pressure, but it just did not feel like it was really grabbing uh, fully tightened. So I think that one's probably already stripped, which sucks. Just be careful. I don't know if the whole size is just a little too big so it doesn't really cut much of a thread because this side feels the exact same way you don't feel like they're um, getting much bite so that takes care of the front there and we'll do the exact same on the rear end And I'm going to put them in the exact same hole locations I did in the front as in the rear. Okay, so that is, <coughs> the shocks are now on. Now, you notice I haven't put on the spur gear cover on yet, and that's just because I haven't mounted the motor yet. Um, I will put it on now just so you 
see what it looks like, what's kind of involved with that. And what I would be doing is the same thing I did in the differentials. I would be putting some grease in here, um, probably in the, the top cover here first, before I put the motor, or uh, put the cover on, just so that, um, you know, there is some lubricant for the gearing. Yeah, I'm going to go back a bit to indicate that they are the M10 screws. So it's been our favorite silver screws we've been using throughout the build. Like I said earlier too, about that one screw, it's going to come up later. Sure enough, it did. So I'm just getting the screw started. And almost tighten all the way down, and then I would just kind of work myself around from one to the other, just slowly snugging them up. That way, even pressure amongst all the screws. That's all the screws there for the cover put back on. So. We are now going to go to the front suspension. So with the front suspension, we are going to require grabbing uh, links like this, as well as there's these little balls that we have to grab as well. We have to grab these little steering arm pieces. So. No, we should only only require one of these particular brackets. That bracket, what? There's two of them. That part number is uh, A5. We only need one of those. There is two. We just need the one. So that standing, standing prep that I've been doing is going to be very important here. The reason why I say that is these little particular balls, they are on the parts tree. And so with them being on the parts tree, they may retain the tab. So you're definitely going to want to kind of sand, uh, sand the, the ball ends so that they become smooth. And don't cause any binding. So that one's done.
Okay, so those are sanded. We're going to go over these parts, knock off the tabs. Just go over quickly with the sandpaper. So now that all those parts are prepped, we're going to start popping in the ball ends. Everything does move very freely, which is great. So we're going to now start putting these parts here together. So with those longer length of screws with the shoulder, we're going to install these. Now just note the orientation of how these are going to go. So how this will go is that you'll see that how they're kind of raised. You got like a bot, these bottom ends are chamfered down. So this is the bottom, and then you can see how this side is, one side is higher than the other. The taller side is going to go towards the center of the car, it'll go towards the motor. So before we put that in, we're going to have these little washers that came in the hardware bag. There are two little metal washers. So you will take your screw, drop it down. Metal washer, and then that package would screw into the chassis. Dab of grease, orientating the taller step towards the motor. I'm going to now thread these in. So I just started in, but you can see how it's stiff. It's set to work it, so I'm going to back this off very slightly. Now it's very, it's very smooth. So you got this is going to be very this whole area is going to be uh, you got to pay attention to how tight how tight you have everything because you will very easily cause everything to bind up. And then you wonder why it's not tracking straight. You turn one way, it stays in that rotating that direction. Then you turn the other way. You turn right, it'll stay kind of going right, and then you turn left and it'll start driving left, and that's because everything's still tight, over-tightened. So this side here, I'm actually able to snug quite up, and it's still loose. Um, so that may happen. Um, I'm going to try flipping the two around because this side was like it's pretty loose where the other side was stiff so I'm going to see what's up there so flip it over to the other side 
see if it feels any better. That's just feels loose. Let's swap the screw out completely then. Let's see how that feels. And this is what I was kind of saying before. You're just going to want to kind of see how it going back and forth. So that just still feels the same. Install this one. And now this one's snug and now it's loose. And now it's, yeah, now that one's actually tightened down and they're both loose. So that's why I mean, you gotta go back and forth, see how it feels because well, on this one, this particular setup on this side was got snug and I have to back it off. And now by flipping it over, they're both snug drop fully, but they are loose. I don't, I don't know. <coughs> so we're going to be grabbing M12 screws at this point now for the steering. So I'm going to give it a measure. So they're like 11 and a half millimeter. And I'm going to need four of them. That's all four. Now, one way to tell them apart, besides the length, is if you look at the very top. Let's see if we get a focus. Come on. There we go. You can kind of see how you can have it slotted to have a flathead. So you can see how the slot goes all the way through. You can put a flathead through it. That's one way to tell the difference between the 10 millimeters. Now even still, I might come back and swap these screws out for a longer one just because there's not a lot of uh seems like a lot of thread engagement by using these screws here so you're going to want to like right now it's it's snug um, so now i'm going to back it off a little bit and i'll keep backing it off until it feels like it's free so i back this off Consider a amount. Let's try a little bit more. Okay, so that's how easy to spin, but it's too loose. So I just gotta inch forward until I find where it's where I'm happy with it. Where it's not binding up. And not loose. I think I'm happy with that. I think. So we'll repeat it on the other side here. So grease on those threads. Back it off. Back it up a little more. Then 
do with that. <coughs> okay, we'll do the other side. The other ends of the links. Now this is going to be a little bit more difficult to determine if it's loose or not. with that. Tighten it up. Back it out. That's a little easier to move than this side. So that could be because of the suspension here. So first of all. Back these off. Uh, no, it still feels stiff, so I'll just go back to the way they were. And like, yeah, as you can see, I've just been going a lot back and forth, snugging up, backing off a bit just to get to the feel, a nice feel. So I'm I'm okay with this. Alright. So with the servo, I'll I'll install the servo, but I'll have to take it apart because um I'll have to like uh, center it first. So what I'm using is uh it's actually a fairly cheap servo. Um ends up being like under twenty dollars ordered off of AliExpress, but you can pick this up for under $30, $20 Canadian, sorry. But you can pick it up for like under $30 Canadian on Amazon. Um, it's a low profile Metal Gear servo. Specs are really good overall. Um, I'm happy with it. So at 6 volts, it's 0 .09 and it's 12 kilograms. It's double ball bearing. Um, low profile-ish. It's not a, like a full low profile, but it's shorter than a standard servo. And the servo horns that come with it are actually of pretty good quality too. It's not like a very thin one. They're decent servo horns. Now I'm going to open this up. Well, probably not have to. Might have to be okay with using this servo setup. Um, so we're going to build up the servo horn. So that has got skipped a couple steps. I called it. So it's right there is the servo horn. And it's indicating to make sure it's centered first. Um, I'm just going to install the servo. I'll do that at a later point. And I mean, it would be better to use a better servo horn uh, because this plastic thing is not the greatest. But I'm going to just use it in the meantime. Uh, the problem is how the horn, it kind of comes back, so it's a little bit difficult to find servo horns like that.
ね。I don't know if I need this particular small piece there uh, for the servo rotation. So the servo sits on this side as such. So the horn's going to go on like that. So sits like that. Now, I don't know. I don't know if they provide you a screw or not for the servo or not, so I might have to grab the one from the servo set. Let's see now. Find the one from the servo. Now the because of the assembly, the screw might be too short that comes with the servo. So I might have to use something else. I got a couple threads in, so surprise that worked. Uh, did that one screw fall? It did, that's why. I'm like, oh, it worked. No, it didn't. Okay, so that popped off, that's why. I will need a longer screw than what comes with this. Um, I guess it does come with screws, it looks like. Looks like they maybe did include some screws. Could be in this this hardware bag might be what they're indicating. So normally you would put some Loctite on this, but again because I'm gonna be taking it apart, I'm not gonna worry about the Loctite. That's interesting. Um, might need to, I'll find out when I install it, but the back of the servo horn sticks out and it's hitting the servo, so that might have to sand that back. I'll find that out later on. Uh, but we'll see how it goes with the full throw and everything. Okay, so okay, we'll go to the next page. So we're gonna fasten on. See. There's something I'm miss. Oh, I am missing. Oh, well, that explains it. I'm like, what? How does it work? It's actually in the servo. There's on the. <laughs> Parts tree, the other servo head. So we'll undo this. Because I figured that that was the whole servo saver, because it's all together in one bag. Clearly, that's not the case. All right, let's redo this. So, let me bump that. Servo. Uh. 
That's better. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we'll take that one individual one. Uh, we're going to use that 12 millimeter, millimeter screw. Which one side is going to feed into that arch looking piece. Making sure that it spins freely so it's a little stiff. Back it off of here. Now it's a lot better. Okay. Go ahead and grab another one of those 12 millimeter screws. I'm going to have to go into another bag. snug, back it off, and that's much more free. Back up a touch more. Okay, as you can see that's all moving quite freely. And now I need to get my uh, standoffs for the servo. So they're on the parts tree for the wheel hubs there, or hexes. So there is a rounded top on these servo mounts. So the rounded sides can go up. And then I go use an M8 screws. And with a little washer. Now the manual is only having me put two screws in. If I have extra screws and i look for some washers, I will put all four in instead of just having the two. Just for the, uh, I don't want the servo to pop out. I'm going to use a flat surface to push those uh, sides of the servo board down flat. So that they end up being flush to the bottom of the servo. Okay. 
So that's there, that's installed. Yeah. Oh, wonderful, Adam. <laughs> went everywhere. Hopefully didn't lose any. We'll find out later. Okay. So we're gonna go ahead and on this side drop the servo down, line it up. Two more shoulder screws for the steering. Make sure that we're free spinning moving, which we are. Looks like these ones we can kind of bottom out and have them snug. That's good. So I'm going to flip this over, grab two countersunk screws to mount that servo in place. So I'll get one started, I'll grab the other countersunk screw. Get the second one started. Almost feels like I should have a longer screw and put like that washer there or something just because of looking at this, you can see how it's already on the, it's like on the angle. And then as you rotate more, it will go more of an angle. So it's almost worth to put a space here right here in a longer screw. Now, one thing I didn't put on, I guess, earlier, are the battery posts. They just slide into those two openings. Let's just backtrack a little bit. So I was going to use an M10, M10 screw on the bottom. OK, 
careful because it seems like the hole's big and it's going to strip. It's got the battery close in there. We're not going to worry about putting a fan trap or anything that. I'd rather not have it covered up. Um, at this time, so I'm just going to leave that bracket off again because I don't have a speed controller mounted either. So we can kind of skip along that step a little bit. Um, I will throw on the hexes because um, I guess I can. Now I'm not going to use these ones. I had issues with these hexes and um, they don't like. When you tighten it on it, they don't rest uh, all that great. Um, they end up start binding. I found last time. And I think those are too long. I think these are too long. Bumping it. So we'll see. These hexes might be fine. So, again, if you notice on these hexes, they have a prominent, um, there's like a prominent step that sticks out, protrudes from it at the end. Right in, in there. Whereas these ones, not so much, and it causes um, it to bind up. So that's why I am using the non-rotor disc. The ones I had the uh, brake rotor. Axle pin. Now, as I said, I might be concerned where I might not have enough thread. Not really a lot of thread going on in comparison to this. Has more thread. Last time I used it, it bound up. And I end up using uh, on a different one, I use a shorter length hex. So, a 
unless the kit and I'm missing something. But it looks like I have to use these ones. Which sucks. I'll probably swap these out for ones that don't have the brake rotor. Just so it doesn't end up crisp binding. I'll say skirt for now. Let's put these on. But I will swap them out. One, because uh, I'm afraid worried of them binding. But the other reason is it's more rotational mass. You know, it might not be much, but when it's rotating, it ends up being like working out to be like three times the weight. This hex off. And, uh, the brake rotor style one's on. It's kind of annoying too because you don't know when it's centered. And it's going to put a stand in the wheel in the meantime. It sounding chunky. Wasn't doing that earlier. Oh, that's why it's. That's why it sounds chunky, that's stupid. I think that's why. And that's good to know. Get this casing back on in the meantime. Of course it's been difficult. So, <clears throat> you'll hear, maybe, and what's going on is hitting the servo. And the servo. Pull that loose, that's all gone. So 
So what I need to do is space the servo out to the edge. A little standoff that holds the servo. Move them over as much as I can to position the servo away from the dry shaft. So what I've done is on the horns, uh, let's see if I can show it. you can see there's a gap here, but not over this side. I've taken these, moved both of them over on the server that way, so that I should clear. See, there is no hitting. Yay! So pin. Slide that. Too far. Slide that in. Grab one rotor, hexes, grab a rim. And slide that down. Last one on. Now, I don't know where that last rim happens to be at this particular time, so I'm just going to tighten down the nut fully. The front of this is actually not as stiff as I was hoping. I thought it was going to be a little stiffer, but it's still good. It's not anything bad. Um, maybe I didn't spin the some of the wheels on it. Okay, it feels somewhat the same, so I guess it's adequate. All right, 
minutes. Let's just finish this car off. We are almost there, everyone. So, like I said, the tires, I have a spec set of tires. I'm actually, I can go grab a set. I'll grab those spec tires and use them. So this is the spec tire that I use for the class that I've tested on dirt. Works very well. Um, they can be bought on AliExpress for um, a decent amount under twenty dollars. Can be bought on Amazon twenty dollars Canadian, and can be bought on Amazon for just over twenty dollars Canadian. Um, it works really good on both tacky dirt uh, mixed with clay and when it's dry. It works fantastic when it's dry. Um, so. I'll throw these on instead. So get these put on. Okay. Ah, look at that bounce. Like I said, in another video, I am definitely going to be addressing that whole bouncing, and it's going to make a world of difference. Okay, so we are going to go for the body post. So it looks like on the front. We have a setup where they use. That's good. Could that be what that is? That's in depth. Oh, okay, that's cool. So you can send it out. Oh, as long as they're new. Cool. Haha. Uh -huh. So, grabbing the body posts currently. Sand down the top area. I'm going to use the knife to take the majority of it off. Okay, so in the both front and rear, we're using a 10 millimeter. But it seems that we're using the ones with the hex head. 
So we are using the hex head style again for a probably bigger surface area. So on the front, we're going to go on the back side of the shock tower. Screw from the front. Rear. So that's that. Finish it off with the front bumper. And grab the front. Again, two 10 mil screws. Okay, and well, it looks like we are done. So, yeah, I would say we're done. Cool. All right, awesome. Well, Thanks for uh, checking out this video. That's essentially done. There's a couple small little things I gotta do. Um, you know, the battery, I gotta put the electronics in, but the bare basic how to build the kit, that's how it goes. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you found it informative. I hope you check in uh, for my next video where I will show you how to make these uh, shocks actually usable. Um, because, yeah, it works out really well, and I think once you see how it works, you might actually end up using it instead of going out and buying shocks. There she be. Alright, cool. This is Adam from Canadian Hobbies, signing out.